Hello, everybody. This is Brother Aiden with ChristianInterviews.com. Um, I have a really good missionary uh, friend of mine, guest today, that I think uh, you're going to totally enjoy his stories uh, from Peru, from the Amazon, and everything that he's doing. Um, as you know, we give away these interviews for free to help uh, build up the body of Christ. And um, his name is Brother John Mortimer. And uh, I'm going to brag on you a little bit first, John, if that's okay. And then you can, you know, add or subtract <laughs> whatever you want from there. So uh, uh, I've known Brother John probably uh, six, seven years now. And he is a, a missionary, church planter, evangelist, pastor, pretty much says it all, servant uh, uh, in Iquitos, Peru, uh, on the Amazon River. He's going to tell some powerful stories today. Uh, Brother John, how many churches have you guys planted so far? Because I, I forgot the number. Right now, churches that we are affiliated with are well over a thousand. Churches that we have physically started ourselves is someplace in the neighborhood of about three hundred. Over three hundred churches, brothers, and uh, and over a thousand affiliated, and then just literally church after church planted down the Amazon, deeper and deeper into the jungle, and 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 just a powerful work that he's doing there that I've seen firsthand with my eyes when I went and visited John, and um, a family man, a man of God. Um, um, raising the ministry and just a just a just a powerful man of faith. And so, um, if you if if it's okay, uh, I'll start off with my standard question, um, which is gonna I'm gonna try to make this my only two part question. All the other ones are single ones. But uh, John, what's the greatest revelation that you've had in in your whole life? Uh, first, for you personally, and then secondly, uh, for the body of Christ. Uh, for me personally, was probably when I was a young young person. I was raised in Mexico. My parents were missionaries in Mexico, and uh, I was, you know, mandated to go to church even though I didn't want to and all that their stuff. And and uh, we were coming back from a church service, and a guy ran into us. We had an accident and pushed a truck right up our truck right up through a wall. And at that time, I was sitting in between um, my dad and this other guy in the front seat of the truck. And when that wall come down, uh, I seen my whole life flash before me. And in that instant, right there, I cried out to God for my salvation. And, you know, I had been raised on a mission field, and I knew God and I seen God, but I didn't know him personally. And I would say my greatest revelation was at that moment, right there, when I come out of that truck, I knew I was saved. I mean, God just made himself so real to me, and I've never looked back. And... I would say my greatest revelation for the for the church is that now is the time for expansion. It is the time for growing, for growing up, for be not being little children in God anymore, but for growing up and becoming men and women of God and discipleship training and, and all those things that, that go into the process of, of helping people mature to be men and women of God. That's powerful. Absolutely. Um Let's go ahead and have you share a couple of stories, maybe one to two of the, uh, or three, however many you want, of the craziest stories of uh, mission work uh, that you've done there uh, in, in the Amazon. Uh, one of the, the, the stories that usually brings a, a, lot of, a lot of laughter is uh, we were going up river. It was three of us. We were going up, we were building some churches. And uh, we were going up on the Thalayo River, and there's a place where the Amazon had cut through into the Thalayo, and there's this really big, deep, deep spot on there. And there's three of us in the speedboat running up to them. We had to cross that area. And coming out of that deep spot on the other side, up into the Thalayo, uh, we hit something. And uh, there's a, a little town right there called, called Lysa, and we hit this thing, and it flipped us over, and we sank. And uh, the people from the town hurried up, come out and rescued us and got us up to shore and, and helped us get our boat out and, and, and get the water out of the motor. And, and we eventually got it running and, and continued our trip. Well, they thought it was a fiera, which is a, a big uh, river monster. Um, we think it's a huge catfish ourselves, but whatever it was, it actually flipped us over and the boat did sink, but we did recover it. Then after we got it running, we went on up and finished our, our uh, trip, what we was going for, and seen the church in, in uh, San Carlos. We got to the edge of the river, and then we had to walk about 45 minutes back. And when we got back in there, it was, you know, we were all still just soaked. I mean, just, just totally soaked. 
And uh, we got back there and had service, had a good time, seen what we needed to see, did what we needed to do. And then we come back out, and on the way back down river, we run out of gas and had to float all the way back because uh, the water had gotten in the gas tank and, and separated the gas out. But anyways, it was a good it was a good time. We we still accomplished what God had us to do, and in spite of the obstacles, so that was good. And and then uh, one another one, we were coming back from the Ritiaco. That river up there is like uh, um, 350 miles away to one of our churches up there. And we were coming back down, and we were in the hovercraft at this time. At this time, we had the hovercraft. And we come down river, and there's this great big sandbar, and I went across the sandbar instead of staying on the water because it's a whole lot shorter. Well, when we got to the other end of the sandbar, there was like a five-foot drop straight down into the water. And I didn't know that was there. And by the time I seen it, we couldn't stop. So I just held out everybody. I, I yelled at everybody, hold on, hold on, hold on. And we went airborne and come down basically nose first down into the water, got water up over the over the front of the hovercraft and on the windshield and stuff. And, and uh, you know, we still made it. We, we're still alive today, but it was exciting at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would say probably our ministry time, the, the most exciting moment, our adrenaline moment, if you want to call it that, is uh, we were up into a village that had never heard about Jesus. We were the first ones ever there to tell them about Jesus. And they were uh, Kokamas. And when we got to the village, they were very, very scared of us because we were white. And uh, there's these rumors, you know, about white people are bad and all this here stuff. So we had a couple brothers from that river with us that, uh, you know, from a church that we had started down river farther. And they were with us and they talked to the people and, you know, got everybody settled down, you know, that we're not bad, we're good. And and uh, we want to share about Jesus. And so we were doing a little uh, a little program with the children and had um, uh, uh, sheets of paper with color crayons. <clears throat> and uh, we did a little Bible story with the children and, and uh, color, you know, had them color. And they had never colored before. They never, they never even knew what a color crayon was. And all of a sudden they start painting on the paper and, you know, they get all the different colors. And, and that was really exciting to see their eyes just open up. And all of a sudden we had all the elderly people there, too because they're, you know, they'd never seen color crayons, and, and uh, we were able to, you know, share gospel with the, with the children, and we did a skit in that, in that time. We did a skit, and a couple of the people got very, very mad at the skit, and, uh, you know, so we, we really didn't know how things were going to go, and, and uh, the, the people that were older were mostly drunk because they'd had a communal work day, so they'd been drinking a lot of their homemade stuff out of Masato. And uh, they got a little bit violent. The the one guy, the chief, uh, fifty some years old, looked at looked at my daughter Melissa, who's now married in Argentina, but at this time she was with us. And he looked at my daughter Melissa, and he decided that he would make a good addition to his collection of wives. And uh, he tried making a deal with my dad, from chief to chief, to uh, to buy my daughter Melissa. <clears throat> and uh, that that was a little bit exciting at the moment. And my daughter Melissa didn't have a boyfriend or anything at the time, and and she was praying, you know, that God would give her wisdom or something to say. And uh, finally, she just told the guy, she goes, "Look, I already have a man." And the guy looks at her, and goes, "What?" She goes, "I already have a man." And then when she come walking by me, she goes to me, she goes, "Dad, I don't know who he is yet, but I already got him." <laughs> <laughs> and and. Uh, and that diffused that situation. You know, I mean, it was a word of God at the time, and even in them small things like that or big things like that, you know, God is still there, and, and he diffused that situation. And uh, then uh, we were able to show a movie on the life of Christ that night and and make some music. We had taken our, uh, you know, a keyboard and, uh, and made a bunch of music and, and were able to share the love of Christ. And, and it was a very difficult situation. For a couple of moments there, we didn't know if they was going to try to come after us or not. But God, God showed His way through. And the last time we stopped there, uh, we were coming down from another church that we have farther up river than that one. And uh, the the people there, the the Curaco, who's the chief, come and talk to me. And, you know, he doesn't know much Spanish. He's very, very broken Spanish. But you can make out what he's saying. He's saying, he goes, Brother John, he goes, we need you. We need the gospel of Christ with us. And uh, so, you know, that is, is very, what do you say, enjoying to see that what you do, even though it might take some time, it's not in vain. 
you know that word doesn't go in vain it it does come back and uh, so we we are very much expecting on getting the church put in there in the real near future that's great to hear yeah people don't realize how serious the situation could have been cuz um missionaries have been killed by you know locals deep in the amazon i mean that's happened before um when I was down there i remember something you said powerful uh i said what 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 would you have to say john to those other missionary organizations that try to say, oh, everybody's been reached on the Amazon. Everybody's been reached. What would you What would you say to that? I, I would say that they've actually never been here. Um, there was a, an organization here that worked here for many years in translating in the Bible up in the jungle here in the Amazon out of Peru. And uh, they come out with a, a thing several years ago before they left. They're actually they're not uh, functioning here in Peru anymore. But uh, they come out and said that there are no more unreached people groups in the Amazon Basin of Peru. Well, that year alone, five new tribes were discovered that had never been reached from the outside world, that had never had any contact with the outside world. And for the last uh, four years, they've been trying to make contact, a group of people have been trying to make contact with one of these tribes. The other four tribes are still in the jungle. They've just kind of like faded back in. And, you know, so there are people here that have not been reached with the gospel. And the jungle is such a vast area, there's no telling really what all is out there yet. That's right. And that's why you reach the ones that are closer to the river, and then they, they can reach in deeper into the jungle themselves. It's just a powerful formula there. What, what, what kind of things would you say about those that have gotten saved in the jungle um, that many Americans and people around the world listen to these interviews uh, just don't know that they don't they don't understand. I mean that um, that is, that is you know eye opening maybe. Um, persecution. When the people get saved in the jungle, like up on Luri Piaco, we are the first people ever to carry the gospel in there, and uh, so we have we have several churches in there right now. But when when they first got saved, the the eldest Christians in there are like nine years old now. And uh, when they first got saved, they could not trade anymore. The people wouldn't, you know, they didn't have money up there at that time. Everything was by trading. You trade your produce for somebody else's produce. You know, like they bring in fish. They've caught a bunch of fish. If you got some bananas, you can trade or yucca. And, uh, you know, so everything was on the trading system. And uh, they, they just became outcasts. Nobody in the, in the area wanted to trade with them anymore. And that was, that was really hard at first. And the first couple of years, they were always ridiculed. And now they still call us hallelujahs, you know. But uh, at least at least because of the Christian testimony that they've seen, um, that, that discrimination and that, uh, that hard persecution has really, really, really let up. Now they're looking for the Christians. Whenever we have a, a, a place where there's a church and there's Christian brothers, they're looking at the Christians for uh, the authorities in the town now. They, when they have their, their voting system and they vote in the authorities, they try to put Christians in because they realize that they, they, are, they are changing. They're more honest people. And uh, that is something that I love to see is how God can take a life and transform it, no matter what it has been in the past. The Bible says that we are new creatures in Christ, new creation. And, and that's what he does. He takes somebody and just puts the love of Christ in there and totally transforms them. And uh, that is, I would say, the, the biggest thing is the persecution is really hard when you get started, but the fruit is also really great because they are truly saved. I mean, they're not, you know, questioning, wishy-washy. I mean, everybody knows it. When you get saved, everybody knows it. And uh, it, it, takes, it takes real commitment to walk through that salvation. Yeah, that's true especially in that situation. You know, another thing I forgot to brag on you about, Brother John, in the start, is that you actually planted a church right next to your mission base there in Iquitos. And uh, and then uh, once the pastor was raised up, you literally just handed it over to him. And, and then he runs it now. And it's grown to be whether the first or second largest, you know, uh, full gospel church in the whole city, which is powerful. I don't know if you want to share anything about that or not. Yes, uh, the church here, the central church, the mission-based church, is the second largest in the city right now. Um, but we've also expanded this last year. We have uh, three churches now in the city of Iquitos that are directly underneath Cosecha, and we have one more that is an affiliate. So we're actually working with four churches in the city right now. 
And, uh, you know, like we said, we believe this is the time for expansion. We believe the kingdom is is coming soon. You know, our, our Christ is coming soon. So it's all about building God's kingdom here on earth. And, uh, you know, that that is expansion. And we have a, uh, what do you say, a real desire to see the churches grow. And one of our churches just had its second or its first anniversary. It's into its second year right now, uh, last month. And uh, it was wonderful to see what God has done through them in just one year. I mean, they've grown so much, and they're, they are totally self-sustaining. And they're only one year old. And they, they've started from the very beginning self-sustaining. So we really appreciate to see that. I mean, we love to see what, what God is doing there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and that you help guard them and hand them over. Speaking of persecution earlier, what's the biggest tragedy or persecution that, that you've ever faced, and how did you overcome it or get healed, and what uh, can I learn, what can other believers learn that listen? Uh, well, that's really hard to say because we've had a lot of stuff over the years thrown at us. We've been shot at. Um, we've been uh, just, you know, there's been a lot of persecution over the years. I would say that the hardest one for me that was to overcome is this was when we were in Mexico, when I was just beginning in preaching the word, and we was, I was working with my father, and uh, we were in this village, and we had had a service. The people come and got us after service and took us up into this meeting, and uh, there was just a whole bunch of people, and man, were they ever mad. And uh, they had their machetes out, and that's why we didn't try to just leave, because there's no way we could have gotten out of there. And they took us up into this meeting, and we had to walk down through the, this line. And there's this table at the end, and there's this guy sitting behind the table on, on this line, on you know, east side of us, were these people with their machetes, and they had ropes. And as we walked in there, they were yelling at us in their, their Aztec, in their, in their uh, language, and uh, some in Spanish, and they were spitting on us, and I mean, it was it was what do you say, um, humiliating and exciting at the same time. And when we got up to the to the desk, the guy spoke pretty good Spanish, and he goes to us, he goes, "You can't be here, you know. We we're gonna um, kill you guys. We're gonna tie you up and kill you, and and you can't be here." And well, we we talked to him, and and at that moment, God had given me grace and give me a word. And I told him, I said, look, according to the to the Constitution, we have the right to, to share the gospel of Christ and to believe any faith that we want. And I had my preacher's card with me that had the, the, the law on it, and I showed it to him. And we talked and talked and talked and talked, and eventually God gave us grace after, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half. And uh, the situation diffused, the people left, and uh, we were able to walk out of there. And a church was eventually established in that town. And, you know, the kingdom of God grew. But I would say at that moment right there, that was a real turning point in my life. It was a, it was a really hard time. Um, but at the same time, we felt the presence of God like we had never felt it before. And it gave us the strength to, to pull through that and actually, you know, see the kingdom of God established in that town also. Wow. What a story. Um, what year did you start the work in uh, Peru? We started here in Peru. Uh, we got a residency here in 1988. So we've been here like 26 years or so, give or take, as as residents. We have been working here, though, uh, for 30 years, okay. 31 years, actually. And uh, the first the first uh, five years, um, we just come in on tourist visas. You know, we come down and, and be here a couple of months and do this and that and the other and get things set up and stuff. And it basically took us five years to get all of the paperwork legal and to become a legal recognized mission by the Peruvian government. And then we were able to come in underneath that legal recognized mission, and we've been here ever since. Wow. Uh, what advice would you have to those who, who think that they that they, they want to be missionaries? I know when we spoke in person that kind of seems to be a misconception, and I agree with you, of, uh, of Americans saying, I'm going to be a missionary, and they're really just, going on vacation for two weeks, but, you know, uh, and that's fine. I mean, if they, if they get touched and, and, and they grow in the Lord and I'm, I'm happy for that, but I mean, a, you know, a full-time missionary, what, what kind of advice would you have for those that think that maybe the Lord is pulling on their heart to be a full-time missionary? 
Um, self-control would be a huge one. You've got to learn to die to self. You've just got to let your own desires, your own self go. And you have to look to a higher call, a higher goal, a higher purpose. If God has called you, he'll make the way. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be, in fact, it'll be really, really hard. But the thing is, is, is if you can die to yourself and say, God, not my will, but thine be done, um, he will make a way. And remember, the first five years are the hardest. If you can make it past the first five years, you, you'll be able to stand. Most missionaries that come down that, that leave the field, they leave anywhere from three to five years. Anybody that makes it over the fifth year has a very good chance of, of actually staying and actually doing something. Um, don't get frustrated. Realize that you're not going to a country to make Americans. You're going to a country to, to bring them Christ. So don't, you know, don't try to Americanize people. Just share the love of Christ and, and try to bring them Christ. Um, like I said, the cultures are so different. Uh, you have to really, really, really die to self, die to your own desires, and really seek God. You know, what is it that he has for me? And, and if this is of God, you can stand on the promise that he will take care of you. No matter how hard the situation gets, uh, he will be there. And with that, with that assurance that he's there with you, um, you can make it. Man, all things are possible, and you can do it. Yeah, absolutely. And and just the fruit. I mean, the fruit is just fantastic. It's just huge in your ministry and others. I believe others who end up staying for those periods of time. Um, I know that you were uh, raised as a missionary in, in Mexico, and I actually I do not remember the story of how uh, you, the Lord moved you to Peru. Um, that that was that's a that's a long one. I'll try to be brief. Um, my mom and dad were missionaries in Mexico. They went there when I was like eight years old or so. And dad always knew that he would be going to the Amazon because he, he, really, he really felt God call him to the Amazon. And he knew Mexico was a training ground to prepare so that he would learn everything he could there so that it would be you know, feasible for him to stick it out and actually make it in the Amazon. And that's why he went to Mexico. And that's the purpose is to learn everything that he could someplace as close to the U.S. and then step out. And after 10 years in Mexico, we come here to Peru, and, and Dad and myself come here together. And uh, our first trip here uh, was a, uh, what do you say, was an eye-opener to say the least. But the reason why we ended up here in Peru is when we left Mexico, we, we were in the States, we went to a public library, and we got some maps of South America because we thought we were going to Brazil. You know, whenever you talk about the Amazon, you only think of Brazil. So we thought we were going to Brazil. So we got these maps of South America. And a, a Christian friend of ours had some cabins up on a little lake, and he let us go and, and stay there for a couple of days. And we're talking about in the, uh, in the early 80s. And uh, it was at the end of season, so there was nobody there except for us. And Mom and Dad were on one side of a lake. And I was on the other side, and I was just really praying and asking God for direction. And, and one morning, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, I heard this name called Pepe Piedra. It's like it jumped in my spirit. So I looked all over on the map, and I couldn't find it. And as I was searching the map and praying over this map at 3 o'clock in the morning, God laid this area on my heart, so I took and circled it. And um, as I was praying, I had another area, and I took and circled it. Well, that next morning, early, as soon as the sun come up, because I didn't sleep, I was just all pumped because God had given me a direction. And uh, I paddled across the lake in this little canoe and got over there, and I knocked on the door. Mom and Dad were just fixing to have breakfast, and they invited me in. And, and I told Dad, I said, man, I was praying last night, and God gave me a direction. And Dad said, he did me too. And I circled on the map where he told me to go. And I said, so did I. So he rolled his map out, and I rolled my map out. And our, our circles were virtually line for line identical. So wow. we knew that we had a direction from God. I mean, out of all of South America, we knew we had a direction from God. And we began to search, where are these circles at? And that's where we found out that they were in Peru. We actually had circled two areas in Peru. And we went to the library again and got books on Peru and found out that their, their official language that they speak is Spanish and about the different indigenous tribes, and we just said, praise God, you know, we don't have to learn another language. We already know Spanish. 
<laughs> God was gracious to us. God was gracious to us. And, uh, you know, we we do not ever regret coming here. I mean, when we first got here, I got off the airplane. I was young. And uh, we come into the city of Iquitos, and it's like, God, you know, why did you even send me here? I mean, I can see this where I was raised. I don't need to come halfway around the world to see this. And I was really in a really bad way for about three days. I had a really bad attitude. I was stinky and grumpy. And there was only one flight a week coming to Iquitos at that time, so there's no way to leave. And uh, I was just, you know, complaining. And then all of a sudden, I felt in my spirit one morning when I was trying to pray and all being all grumpy and mean and I felt in my spirit, and God said, you know, you're missing what I have for you. And it, it just seemed like a light bulb turned on, and, and I went and I talked to, to my dad and the other guy that, that had come down with us. This is our very first trip here. You know, we didn't know anybody or anything. And I talked to him, and, and I apologized. I said, you know, I'm so sorry for my stinking attitude the last couple of days. And uh, God spoke to me and said that I'm missing what he has for me. So, you know, I'm going to open my eyes and open my spirit, and I'm going to see what God has. And at that time, that, that day, that evening, we met a guy here, a Christian brother, and uh, we started getting into different churches and preaching. And the, a couple days later, we went up into the jungle, and we spent about a week up in the jungle. And when we left, my heart stayed. And my heart just stayed in the jungle. I mean, I knew that I knew that I knew that that's where God wanted me. And, you know, I realized at that moment how close I almost came to missing the perfect plan because I was in such a bad attitude that I couldn't have seen it. And I really praise God for giving me an opportunity to get out of that attitude and to actually look and see what he had for me. And, you know, like I said, I do not ever regret spending my life here. Wow, powerful. All right, just two more questions and then we're done. Thank you for your time. Um, Who has been the biggest mentors in your life uh, how have they in, how have they impacted you? And secondly, how important is mentorship? I believe that a mentorship or a coach, discipleship, but whichever name that you want to put on it, is indispensable for the time that we live in. Uh, the two people that have spoken to my life, that have been there for every single powerful thing that have helped me become who I am. Uh, first is David Hogan, and the other one is my dad. Uh, these are three guys that we worked with all the time, the three of us together, and uh, through the experiences, the teaching, and the, the just stick them to it, you know. You don't give up. You make it through. You can make it through Christ. Through all of that, it has just changed my life and has made made – um, the way for us to be who we are right now, and that in turn we are investing in our kids. Um, my one daughter is married to a guy in Argentina. They're working in their church, in his church, the uh, the church that he's affiliated with over there in Argentina. Um, I have another daughter who's in Rama, fixing to graduate this year, and my son Vince is here with us here in Peru, working with us. So you know, we we and his wife, he just got married in January. So we are, uh, you know, investing what we've learned in our kids, not only our spiritual kids, but our physical kids. And I would say that right now, at this point in time in, in, in our world's history, a, a mentor is a vital, vital, vital tool. Because when you have a problem, which you will, you have somebody that you can get in touch with, that you can call or email, and, and talk you through the hard things in your life. Right now I have two other people that are in the United States that uh, um, basically are like my mentors now, and they are my counsel. I mean, every time when we have a major decision, and a lot of times even not our major ones, um, I'm on the phone with them or on the email with them and getting advice, getting counsel, because, you know, this is not the Lone Ranger stuff. This you need you need God's people with you because in in the multitude of counsel there's wisdom, and the growth that you can get, how much you can grow from other people that are men and women of God, uh, you can't put a, you can't put a uh, a price on that. You can't put a number on that. Uh, being out there by yourself, you can easily lose focus, and you can easily become 
you know, discouraged and, and, and basically trapped in bad decisions. But when you have a mentor, when you have people that speak into your life, they can help you because they're looking from the outside in. Absolutely. That's a great word. Great word. Last question here. Um, what's the, uh, you know me, I believe in miracles and healing miracles. And I know that uh, uh, you've seen a lot, but if you could just pick one, what's the craziest or the biggest miracle you ever personally saw? Uh, I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miracles. I would say the 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 one that stands out the most in my life that right now even just talking about it I'm getting goosebumps again is uh, we were in a conference up river we had brought all the different churches together to one central location and we were having three day teaching seminar and uh, it, after the service that night we had a a time of prayer where people you know come up for prayer and we had a a couple of lines of people and because there was just a lot of people and we were praying for all these different people and and uh uh, my wife was by this this uh, lady that had her, a baby in her arms, and uh, she called me over. My wife called me over, and I went over there, and, and she goes, John, she goes, I think this baby is dead. And I, I looked at the mother, and she's, the mother is just, just losing, and I'm just, just on, on the verge of going hysteric. Uh, she's just screaming, you know, my baby, my baby, my baby's dying, my baby's dying. And, and I asked her, you know, who she was, and, and, and she was from another village, and she was there. You know, my heart just went out because you don't come to a conference to have your kids die. You know, you come to a conference to learn more about God. And, and my heart just went out, just broke for her, and, and I, I asked her, I said, do you believe that God can heal your child? And she goes, yes. So I put my hands on the baby, and as soon as I did, I just pulled my hands away because the baby was just cold, just cold, cold. And I looked at my wife, and I said, you know, I, I think this baby is dead. And the eyes were open and just glassed over. There was like a haze. There was nothing there. They just dry, glassed over eyes. And I cried out to God, and I said, God, you know, I know you're real. I've seen your power before. And, and I put my hands on this baby, and I began to pray. And my wife was right beside me, and we were praying for this child. And all of the sun, I felt hands grab my finger and my thumb. And I looked down, and that baby was looking at me with these great, big, live, juicy eyes. And he had a hold of my fingers. And he Praise began to scream. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big white guy, you know, with a beard. And this little tiny kid didn't even scream. He just looked at me. And, and I looked at the mother, and the mother's eyes were like ten times bigger than normal because she had felt the power of God. I mean, I felt it come out of my chest, through my arms, and into that child, and that child come alive. And uh, last time I seen that child, that child's 12 years old now, and at that time he was just a baby, but his name is Gabriel. And I, I would say that is, that is the, a huge mark in my life of seeing the power of God. Praise God. Wow, that story touches me. Um, wow, so we've got a... We've got to wrap this up. Um, I'm going to share your website for those that want to help support the uh, the work and the mission you're doing. Let's just do a recap on what, what projects you're working on right now, uh, what you need help with, uh, how people can get involved. And the uh, site, before I forget, is www.thegospeltabernacle.org. That's who Brother John is affiliated with and through. Um, you can reach him through there to help him. Um, um, you know, uh, I always just say it like this, guys. We uh, we need to help Jesus come back by reaching all the world. And, I mean, that's really good ground to sow in is where they've never, ever heard the gospel, ever heard the gospel in the, in the deep in the Amazon. So what um, needs do you have now, or what are you working on now? Uh, we have some really big needs right now um, because of the economical situation, the, the finances, the dollar, whatever, everything has just gone very extremely expensive. Uh, we have a, a really big expense on our river trips. Um, you know, we, we use our hovercraft, we go up into the jungle, we use other boats, we use public transportation and stuff like that, but we have a huge expense in fuel. And if people would like to help sponsor a trip up into the river like we have in um, July, we have a conference where we're planning on having like, like uh, you know, 380, 400 people there this year at this conference. It'll be the third time we've had one up there. 
and you know the expenses, the food, the, all the little literature, everything that's needed to be involved in that. That's 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 a really good investment. And also, uh, we're starting another Bible school. We have one Bible school that uh, we started uh, two years ago, and uh, it it has been functioning well. But we're starting another school. We'd like to start it this year. That is with uh, um, more theological, a higher level. You know, because what we see is there's a lot of Christians, but not a lot of Christians with a lot of knowledge. And we would like to help the body of Christ grow to that next level. And uh, there's uh, different building projects that we have as far as, like, different churches that we're building, um, conference houses, you know, stuff like that. So there, there is just a lot, a lot, a lot that needs to be done. That's right. Yeah. And you're, you're one of the men putting your hand to the plow, and you have proven it. So once again, it's the, the gospeltabernacle.org, and then you can find John Mortimer's information there to, uh, to give. And thank you again for your time. Uh, uh, and uh, for your stories and your work and everything that you're doing, uh, Brother John. Yeah, thanks for the interview. I very much enjoyed it.